see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Um, okay, hi, it's Edwin Roach from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Alan Side, who's from Cascadia Workshops. And thank you for joining me, Alan. Really appreciate this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, Alan, I saw a, a, a video that you did. It was, I think it was called On Empathy. It was like a 10 minute uh, short uh, kind of explanation of empathy. And yeah, I think the title was How to Do Empathy. Oh, how to Do Empathy. I thought that was really well done. I mean, it was like, mm, thank it's you. like you have a really, a really nice way of kind of presenting the material and laying it out in a very uh, simple to grasp uh, way. So I really enjoyed cool. that. Good. Yeah. So, well, what I wanted to explore here uh, with you is kind of the question of how do we build a culture of empathy? So um, I know you're doing, or perhaps you may should introduce yourself for, first. I know you work with uh, nonviolent communication and you're a trainer and kind of what else uh, kind of work are you doing around that? Um, well, my background is in sustainability work and not just ecological sustainability, but also looking at social equitability and e things being economically viable also. I have a facility for presenting other people's information in front of groups. So there are actually five different fields that I teach workshops in. I give people a guided tour of Ken Wilber's Integral Model. I'm a, a member of the New Roadmap Foundation Speakers Bureau. They're the folks who published Your Money or Your Life. So uh, I teach that financial integrity program too. I teach the Eight Shields model that I learned from John Young of Wilderness Awareness School and um, the, uh, oh, I forget the name of his school in California, but John Young, uh, student of uh, Tom Brown Jr., the tracker. And so I do a lot of different things. I live on 25 acres in which uh, I also teach permaculture design. I have a certificate in permaculture design. I've had that for over 10 years. And we're doing a lot of... Uh, permaculture-based forestry work and have uh, a bit of experience in intentional communities. So some of my clients are co-housing groups and, and uh, places like that. I do facilitation work. So I do a lot of different things. But mainly the, the people that I like to work with are people that I, I call positive change agents. So people who are committed to making the world a better place and also making themselves better people. So uh, we go by a lot of different names, cultural creatives, social entrepreneurs, evolutionaries, sustainability activists. So these are the types of people that, that I enjoy working with and that comprise my, my client base. Oh, so you're, you're like work doing a lot more than just uh, nonviolent communication or compassionate communication. You're like working with uh, a lot of the uh, environmental groups. and. Yes, stuff. absolutely. One of my clients has been the U.S. EPA. And one of the classes that I've taught at U.S. EPA is communication skills for effective collaboration. So you'll have people who are running a meeting where there's an oil company executive and somebody from an Indian tribe and somebody from the local community and somebody from the state agency and people are yelling at each other. And, and so uh, I don't even use the terms nonviolent communication or NVC, but I come in and, and help them learn how to slow down and how to help people really hear each other and find the common ground and work toward win-win outcomes. I have quite a bit of training with, with a DRC, the Dispute Resolution Center. So basically all these different aspects of what we could call making the world a better place and also personal development work, um, that, that's, my, that's my fascination and, and my passion and kind of my obsession. And so that's, that's the field I've been in since I was probably 16. Oh, wow. So it's I'm really, it's, it's around, way. what's that? I'm 41. 41, well, you've been at it for a while then. Uh, so yeah. it's really about uh, mediation, getting people to communicate with each other then. It seems to be a large part of it. That is, that is a large part of it. And the part that I'm most interested in is not so much the conflict resolution side as the conflict prevention side. And helping people really learn the skills so that we prevent misunderstandings and we prevent uh, stepping on each other's toes, and we can really explore how to find a mutually agreeable outcome in, in any situation. Yeah, so um, so the question is, I was kind of posing at it, is how do we build a culture of empathy? And I think that fits yes. right in with what you're talking about. Because for Absolutely. me, if we have a culture of empathy, uh, it's already preventing a huge amount of the conflicts, you know, before they even yeah. start. 
and it's like yes. having the tools and and uh yeah. you know and uh, you know maybe even teaching it in schools because i'd asked you previously about how do we build a culture of empathy and, and you said hey we need to do it in the schools absolutely yeah is that, uh, is that something you're working with in the schools or not directly i do work with one particular school where i was finding that i had some time with the with the students with the children but realized that the, the greatest impact that I could have on the young people was to work with the adults because I could teach them a different way of listening and a different way of being present with each other, but everything they're seeing modeled at home or from their teachers it was going at cross purposes with what I was sharing. And it was, it was like, for them, it was like swimming upstream. So I found that I could have a bigger impact working with the teachers and with the parents than directly with the students and finding that the teachers can start to show up in a different way and the, the parents can start to show up in a different way. And that, that really has a big impact on the kids because they, they, they learn a lot more by how we model and what we do than by, uh, you know, us lecturing them. Yeah. So it's really, instead of like curric creating a curriculum for the uh, students, it's like get the uh, parents and the, the teachers to really embody em empathy. Yes, parents, teachers, and administration. And, of course, we want to work with the students, too. But it doesn't work to work only with the students. We have to work with the adults, definitely. So what, how do you uh, kind of convey or teach the empathy or to the adults and, and the teachers? What kind of a process or method are you using? Well, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a certified trainer in Marshall Rosenberg's process, nonviolent communication. And one of the things that I've learned from nonviolent communication, also known as NVC. And for, for those of people watching the video and who aren't familiar with the process, the reason it's called nonviolent communication is because Marshall wanted to align himself with Gandhi's movement of nonviolence. But in Hindi, they had actual words that we didn't have a translation for in English. So satyagraha means roughly soul truth or soul force or the power of the truth. And ahimsa is a little bit like the Buddhist concept of loving kindness. And so empathy, I think, is one of the wings of the bird, because that's the, that's the listening piece. That's the being present for each other. That's the compassion piece. But the other wing of the bird, I think, is authenticity. It's how do we share honestly what's true for us in a way that will elicit a compassionate response from the other person, and in a way that's most likely to result in our own needs being met in a way that's in harmony with other people's needs. So I can be totally present to you, Edwin, and be very empathically, compassionately present. But if you're not willing to be vulnerable, if you're not willing to share honestly what's going on for you, it may not go very far and vice versa. You could be very empathic toward me, but if I'm hiding, our connection isn't going to really happen. So I think those are those are the two wings of the bird is authenticity and compassion. So part one of the ways that I that I approach teaching empathy is I tell people it's really about being present. In in a lot of the nonviolent communication circles, we talk about giving people empathy. And so when somebody's in a lot of pain, they have a safe place to vent, they have a safe place to share what's going on for them that's non-judgmental, where they, where they really feel heard and they feel gotten. and But technically, we don't give somebody empathy. Technically, what we give them is our full presence with our whole being. So it's not just an intellectual understanding. It's like fully grokking, fully getting with my, my whole being what's going on for you. And as a result, your need for empathy is met. So that's a little bit of how I think about it. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it, the empathy, there's, there's the part of... Um, as I mean, I've seen that as well, is that is, if we can be authentic about our own experience or if I can be authentic um, and, and share what's kind of going on for me, like, oh, I'm feeling a little nervous or I'm feeling, you know, detached or something like that. I can just talk about where I am and kind of be honest about it. It kind of creates yeah. a space. I'm kind of going deeper, sharing deeper into myself and you're able to kind of hear that and it, it kind of maybe opens the door for for you to go deeper as well absolutely it gives me permission to be authentic and 
uh, it's, it gives other people the opportunity to, to, to be present with you in an empathic way or to give you empathy when you start to share authentically what's going on for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of wonder about that authenticity is how to be, you know, how to, how to actually do it. It's like, um, for example, I, I tend to kind of, I will kind of you know, sit, kind of be present just with myself, kind of listening to you, and I can feel what's going on in my body. Mm. You know, and then it's like, uh, how do I express the authenticity? You know, where does that, auth where is, where is that authenticity bubbling up? And, you know, how do I kind of like tap into it? Do I, do I yes. talk about, well, I'm feeling kind of relaxed, but I'm also feeling a little stressed, you know, about mm -hmm. wanting to keep the conversation going and try to make yes. it interesting. So I feel a little bit of stress around that or, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's like I want to find interesting things to say, make sure it's kind of uh, engaging. But yeah. I also feel like a sense of, you know, calmness as well. So I feel a little split, you know, but maybe it's kind of like, a, you know, it, I don't know, am I being authentic at that point? Or, you know what I mean? It's like, how do you kind of tap? I kind of wonder how do I um, tap into that authenticity, you know? Yes, yes. You know, part of part of the way I think about it is, trying to think about what is it that you're wanting in the moment. So if, uh, if I'm at the checkout in the grocery store and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm connected to what is alive in me in terms of what I'm trying to do, that doesn't mean that I sh I'm sharing every detail of my life with the cashier at the store and every little thing I'm feeling and every little... So a lot of it has to do with what's our intention in any particular moment. And what is it that we're wanting? So uh, I'm, I'm building a, a coaching program right now online that's a communication skills coaching program. And one of the stories that I just filmed just earlier today was a story about being at a gas station, filling up my car with gas, and somebody drove by in their car and threw a cigarette, a lit cigarette, out their window in the direction of the gas pumps. And... So first I was scared, and I, I thought I had to hide, duck and cover. Then I noticed that the first thing that came up in my mind was, what a flipping idiot. <laughs> and, and, so, and, and, I, and then I noticed that my heart was pumping, and, and then I was able to take that judgment that I had of them and sort of translate it and realize, okay, when I saw them throw their cigarette butt, I felt scared, and I really value my safety, and I really value self-awareness and self-responsibility. So then I realized that I had a choice whether to give the person feedback or not. And this was a big guy, so I was risking getting my butt kicked, right? So, um, so I walk into the convenience store ready to give this person feedback. And I open the door to the convenience store, and the way it was set up was the line was moving toward the door. So he's right there at the front of the line. And what I said to him is I said, uh, excuse me, I feel a little nervous saying this. But uh, when I saw you throw your c cigarette in the direction of the gas pumps, I felt pretty nervous because I really value my safety. And before I could even continue, the woman he was with, she, she pops her head out from behind him on the line and she says, what's he saying to you? And clearly she heard some kind of attack or criticism and he turned around to her and he said, um, no, 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 it's okay. He's right. And then he turned to me and he said, thank you. And I was like, okay, no problem. And then, I, because, because really what I was wanting, my intention in that moment was really to be heard. I wasn't asking for him to make an agreement that he would never do it again. And I, uh, I, I, I was clear that really I was wanting to be heard. And so when he turned and said thank you to me, it was complete. And so I thanked him and I left. But, you know, I think the things that really worked for me in that conversation, Edwin, were, I guess, the minor point is that I started out saying, excuse me, I feel a little nervous because I think sometimes unexpressed emotion can come across as aggression, especially if we're nervous or scared. Because when I'm scared, I, I can be pretty intense. But if the other person doesn't know I'm scared, it can come across as aggression. So, so just being vulnerable in that way, and just, that can really take the edge off and be disarming. But then the other thing that I think really worked for me was that I shared what happened in a more objective way. I said, when you threw your cigarette but in the direction of the gas pumps. I didn't say when you stupidly threw your cigarette butt, when you idiotically, when you mindlessly threw your cigarette butt. I had all those judgments. So in terms of your question about being authentic, 
I think sometimes we need to be discerning about what's going to serve and what's not going to serve. I, I didn't think it would serve for me to share those judgments, even though I had them. I just kept that clear when you threw your cigarette in the direction of the gas pumps. Because if I had shared a judgment, then that would have gotten in the way of the connection right away. And that's not what I was wanting. My intention was to really be heard. So then I was able to continue and say I felt nervous and I had a need for safety. So, so that's, that's what comes up for me when you, when you mention the, like how, how are we authentic. It's first of all being clear what's, what's our intention in that moment. What are we wanting? And then the other piece is being somewhat discerning about what's going to serve the connection and, and what's not going to serve the connection so that we can um, be very clear in our communication with the other person. Yeah, so in that case, you wanted connection with the person, but you also wanted to express your concern and know yeah. what's going on for you. And yeah. somehow that judgment uh, is something that seems to kind of get in the way of, of that sense of uh, connection. Absolutely, absolutely. And so part, so in my work, one of the things I do is I help people notice first that they're being judgmental. It could be to someone else or it could be about themselves. And then how to translate that judgment with more of a heart-based language so that we can really be empathically present with ourselves. And I think that's exactly the kind of work that would be lovely if it happened more in schools where we taught students to express what's true for them, not in judgmental language, but in a language of feelings and needs and requests. And also, I would love to see it happen more in the mainstream media. I would love to see it happen more in Hollywood movies I remember there was an experiment, this must have been at least a decade ago, in Mexico, uh, which is, you know, soap operas are huge down there, and some of the producers decided to introduce some sort of social learning themes and memes into the soap operas, and apparently there was a measurable result. Uh, statistically, I think the, some of the themes had to do with something like birth control, and they started to see changes in people's behaviors because these people they were watching every day on TV, people, they characters they looked up to uh, were making certain choices. And I think that our Hollywood directors could be a lot more wise in terms of how they introduce certain themes and how the, the, the heroes that we look up to, how they model uh, the kind of culture that we want to create. Yeah. So it's, uh, the, I mean, a typical Hollywood movie is kind of about, you know, kind of the violence and you overcome violence and with violence. And uh, it doesn't kind of get into the nuances so much of how people are are relating yes. and yes. creating different models for relating yes. kind of more effectively. Yes. Yes. And in, in those Hollywood movies, there's always the good guys and the bad yeah. guys. Judgment. And the bad guys deserve to be punished and humiliated and... And uh, it's, it's really sort of an old mythology. And I, I, think, I think as a human species, I do feel hopeful, actually, Edwin. I think that we are learning to outgrow the old stories about who we are and what the good life is. We're, 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 we haven't fully developed all the new stories, but I think we're ripe. We're ready. For, we're hungry for new stories and new models. And so it's it's a really exciting time to be alive. Well, there's all these uh, reality shows out there, but they, they tend to be uh, kind of based on judgment and hierarchy and kind of demeaning yeah. of someone. It's like there's always, and it's competitive. So somebody's uh, um, voted off the island, voted off the job, voted off something. Uh, yeah. And it's about scheming to kind of go up in the hierarchy and some kind of a, you know, some kind of a, you know, reality show, I mean, I don't know if we'd call it maybe an empathy show or something, just kind of showing, modeling yeah. how, how uh, to uh, solve problems, you know, how to, how to do that conflict resolution. Um, Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, the thing about those reality shows is that someone like me can watch that and actually be entertained and at the same time not take it seriously and not give it any credence. But I really like the idea of what you're talking about. You know, there was a couple that I heard about not too long ago in Israel who had created a play and they went on tour and they had created a play that was based on teaching the principles in nonviolent communication. And it can be very full of um, 
passion mm-hmm. and, 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 and Drama. You, can, you can have a story arc where you build tension and then that tension gets resolved somehow and you can, it can be very intense and very entertaining. It doesn't have to be uh, Namby Pamby vanilla milk toast. Yeah. It, it can, it can, it can be very entertaining for people and, and still the message is much more positive. And I think that's one of the things that um, a lot of the, um, the script writers haven't met, maybe necessarily learned how to do so maybe maybe you and i need to collaborate on a script or something let's do it well let's they, create a they, reality they, show you know? clear, <laughs> clearly need that. the alan and um, edwin uh, reality show of empathy i'm all for it <laughs> yeah who can who can navigate a sea of conflict yeah that'd be that'd be an interesting thing so uh yeah there's I, I a, think, a quote by uh johan galtung um Who's uh, he was responsible for starting a lot of these peace and conflict studies programs around the world in the universities, and uh-huh. he says uh, peace is resolving conflict with empathy, nonviolence, and creativity, and it's a never-ending process. So I think I right like there is the uh, formula for yeah. uh, you know for one of these reality. Uh, yeah. programs you know is yeah and resolving con- those conflicts that come up with the empathy and the creativity for me it's like the 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 nonviolence is almost inherent in the word empathy in itself sure. because it's just so you can almost make the formula you know resolving uh, conflict with empathy and creativity and it's never ending kind of drama yes I think that's one of the biggest limiting factors in resolving conflicts is our creativity and our imagination. Absolutely. So I, I'm curious, Edwin, how do you define empathy? Well, if you, you know, I've, summarize... I've really looked at it from a very eclectic uh, view. Because I, I know there's a, I've been involved with the nonviolent communication uh, community here in the Bay Area, but I've also, you know, connected with the scientists, the academics, you know, artists. So. I've kind of tried, I know in your video, you mentioned there's like eight or 10 different ways of defining empathy. And there's yeah. even a lot of confusion, not confusion, but different, uh, you know, approaches to defining it even within academia. But from yes. pulling it all together, I've created kind of four parts of empathy. Uh, the first part, I, the first part I call uh, self-empathy, which actually, received it got that idea from the nbc community is it's about yeah. sensory awareness and mindfulness to just what's going on yes. in our body so you know it's like taking a breath and just feeling you know just being aware you know calming and feeling the the minute uh sensations that are going on in our body and you know mindfulness practice from yes. uh, meditation is helpful there's a yes. whole community around uh, sensory awareness uh, yes. so there's a, and the arts have a lot of, you know, becoming aware. So it's just that awareness where your awareness and presence with yourself. And then as we have that, then kind of our uh, awareness opens our, mm-hmm. that then we have mirrored empathy, which mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. as I'm looking at you and you're shaking your head through mirror neurons, you know, the, the neurons, uh, fire when we do an action and when we see the action. So as I'm yes. seeing you, you know, shake your head, I am mirroring emotionally your uh, agreement or yep. and, and the energy. And even it, with your voice, you have a certain voice. I'm mirroring that inside myself. So I'm getting a sense mm-hmm. emotionally who you are. So I become kind of a mirror of you, you know, and, and all the parts of presence, you know, fit in. The more presence, the more open I am the more I can Mm. kind of mirror you. Then there's the third part. um, And that's also with the academics, they'll call it um, uh, empathic, uh, you know, um, emotional empathy or, or uh, uh, affective empathy. So that's, Mm -hmm. there's kind of different terminology, but I like the mirrored uh, kind of word because I think it's most descriptive. Then there's uh, what I call imaginative empathy, which is also called perspective taking or cognitive empathy. And uh-huh. that's kind of as we have self-awareness that we are se- separate entities yes. with different perspectives that we can see another person's perspective. Like, well, if I'm coming from that perspective, what would that look like? So the the person who is yes. um, 
on the uh, you know throwing that match that whatever that cigarette or whatever towards the, the you know the, the you know the there he's like saying oh well I can kind of see his perspective if I was there you know I I, I can see it from that point of view you know what, yeah. what would I kind of feel and then yeah. the uh, fourth part is um, empathic action which is that as we kind of line up these different uh, qualities and move deeper uh, with each, you know, understanding each other, that mm -hmm. then we take is when we work together to do something like we talked about, let's create a reality show. So, so it's like working together with, um, uh, and where there's no blocks to action. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you've been in maybe a group and then they say, well, let's do this. And people aren't really getting along. You know, there's like resistance to it. And it's because somebody hasn't been heard. You know, there's somehow there's right. not a deep enough connection. Usually. Yeah. And then, you know, so it's like maybe, you know, empathic action is kind of maybe even is a kind of the kind of final, um, you know, part where we're working together in a harmonic, harmonic or harmonious yeah. kind of a way. So yeah. that's kind of my kind of synthesis from the different. Um... I like that. Yeah, where, where I had gotten that number of so many different definitions of empathy, is I, I simply looked it up on Wikipedia and I saw there were 14 or 17 definitions on the main article. And then uh, in the video I did, I, I just simply defined, well, this is this is how I see it and how I work with it. And uh, it seems that, the you know, and I, I gave it a little bit of a, of a maybe not provocative, but a little bit of an intriguing title because so many people think of empathy as passive. And I titled the, the, the video, How to Do Empathy, because I wanted to emphasize that, that, that there is an active part of it. And how do we actually put that into practice? So um, I think that really resonated for people. And I, I'm glad that somebody forwarded you the video or somehow you, you came across it because, um, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the, the feedback that I got from that. Yeah, and you yeah. had talked about. Do you want to go through your video a little bit? You're talking about presence, right? The kind of the aspect of. I, um, I think one thing I'm wanting to do is like with NVC is kind of merge that more with the understanding kind of that model of empathy. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think sometimes empathy within NVC as well as I'm just listening and kind of you know reflecting, and yeah. the whole you know. Uh, components of all the different steps of empathy aren't uh, yeah, kind there's, of incorporated. Yeah, so there's a whole range of what we can call empathy, and it seems like, if I'm hearing you accurately, that within the way people are practicing nonviolent communication, it seems to emphasize just one narrow band of what, what's a whole range of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I could, I could see that too. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the factors that influences that, I think, is the... the um, the skill level of, of the of the person practicing NBC because sometimes when we're when we're new at something it's uh, we tend to we tend to try to take things more literally and really really sort of do things by the book and, and we follow the letter of the law more than the spirit of the law and so sometimes people get um, a little bit attached to a narrow narrow view of it uh, I very much liked uh, what you described those those four different levels of empathy yeah. So, uh, so what is it? So, w was there something specific that you wanted to talk about? Um, well, I'm looking at yeah, is is more how do we build a culture of empathy? So here we've kind of explored empathy a little yeah. bit, but yeah. um, and a lot of the empathy, even your your um, your video, it was kind of was uh, about uh, kind of this personal empathy, right? It's like how do you do it at a personal level? And I think exactly. that's really important, but there's also this larger societal, you know, Absolutely. does a society support empathy? Like in a school, uh, you know, Absolutely. if a teacher is up there, you know, kind of just talking yeah. to the students, that's a structure, that's a social structure, and there's some empathy yeah. in it, but it, it's it's, yes. it's maybe a low level because, uh, yeah. you know, it's just one person talking to uh, many versus if you turn yeah. it into a circle process or you broke it into small groups. And right. so I'm yeah. really looking at how do we do it personally, but at the larger societal level. I was just wondering if you had thoughts about that. I, I like that very much. I think I think there's a there's a there there are kind of two directions 
that I see that social change can happen. And I think they're both important. And a lot of people emphasize one over the other. And I think they're both really important. One is, um, like you're saying, uh, being able to, in, you, I know this was just an example, rather than having the teacher speaking to all the students, even if she is expressing um, something that's empathic in some way, that they could change it to change structurally change it to be more of a circle process or more of a um, maybe even like a where there's a talking stick or, or some other format and that we can do that on a societal level we can change um, some of the ways that say governance happens or some of the ways that we we structure our, our social institutions and that that would automatically uh, sort of help people up level in terms of how they relate to each other. And um, I think that that's a, that's a really important direction. The other direction um, is where if it is sort of like the personal development direction where if somebody's working on themselves, if I'm, if I'm up leveling my level of consciousness and my ability to be present toward others and my ability to express myself authentically and clearly, then I get to up-level the conversations of which I'm a part of. And as we up-level our conversations, then we can start to transform social institutions. So I think, it, I think that both directions are really important. We need to work on the structural level. We need to work on the, the institutional level and on the forms that our, our lives operate within. And then that starts to affect the we space and that also starts to affect the I space. And uh, both are important. As far as, uh, you know, how do we actually create a culture of empathy? I think that I see two limiting factors. One limiting factor would be our knowledge. And the other limiting factor would be our imagination. And by knowledge, I mean our awareness of things that already exist that work. For example... Dominic Barter's work with restorative circles. Uh, Tom Atlee, I don't know if you're familiar with the Co-Intelligence Institute. No, I haven't heard uh, of that. Co, Co-Intelligence.org. And, you know, one of the things Tom Atlee talks about at the Co-Intelligence Institute is that as groups of people, we can be, a group can be more intelligent than the added intelligences of all the individuals. As, as, as a group, there can be a synergistic quality. And most of the time, groups, we end up, um, manifesting co-stupidity more than yeah. co-intelligence. It's like you're, but, it's less intelligent than the sum of the parts, kind of. It's very often. Uh, because of the conflict and, within it. Some, yeah. Uh, or, or simply the, that, that we're not hearing each other. It may not be overt conflict, but we're just not really getting each other. And one of the things that Tom Atlee has done is he has documented hundreds of different processes and um, different things that can happen structurally and in terms of governance and in terms of um, different types of facilitation processes. And um, I'm having a hard time articulating no, it. What but, you're saying, there's but, all these different processes that encourage connection and empathy. And it's like you need to, and they're, they're, they're kind of like separate pieces out there in society. And it's a matter of bringing them together into a kind of a coherent whole, maybe. Is, well, well, part of what, I'm, well, what I started to say was that in terms of creating a culture of empathy, I think there are two limiting factors. One oh. is our knowledge and one is our imagination. And so, so one of the pieces would be our knowledge of what's out there that already works, mm. our knowledge of possibilities. Oh, you mean we don't have to sit theater style? We could sit in a circle? Wow. Um, open space technology is an example of conferences that self-organize. So, so just knowing what our options are, knowing, knowing what the menu is of, of possibilities. And the other is, is our imagination and really being able to imagine what is not yet and be able to look into a space where something hasn't been created yet and imagine new possibilities. So one of the reasons I think we don't have a culture of empathy is because we're not yet evolved enough, both as individuals, but also in terms of our social structures and, and, and the, certainly the ways we interact with each other. So um, 
I'm very hopeful that we're moving in that direction. And I think your your work and, and your efforts are, you know, helping to move us all in that direction. So Yeah, so you're uh, saying, um, if I'm hearing correctly, that like the yeah. blocks, what's blocking us from uh, creating a culture of empathy or deepening empathy is we just don't have the resources or are not knowledgeable about the resources that are available. Yes. And if we were knowledgeable about those, that would kind of help build, you know, personally, you know, moving forward with a cult, you know, building empathy. So it's absolutely. And how do we overcome that um, block then of lack yeah. of knowledge? One of the one of the one of the blocks in our culture is that things are moving so fast, and people, you know, one of the one of the most scarce resources is people's attention, and. I, I was the chair of a sustainability committee for a local group here, and the purpose of this group, I think, was to have meetings. But the reason that it was such an important group is because we would have um, the superintendent of the public school district, we, we had the director of county planning and development, we had the director of county parks, we had... Um, county council people we had the presidents of local chambers of commerce from some of the small cities around us so we had all these people coming together who never shared information in any other forum mm. and you have people who are making decisions about land use policy how a certain area you know are we going to have a factory there are we going to have a park there are we going to have a you know restore a wetlands people making decisions that are going to affect you know, future generations for a long time, and they're not sharing information with each mm. other. And so that's, that's what I mean about, in, in some ways, just imagining the possibility of a forum like that is one of the things that um, more and more places, I think, could enact. So yeah, certainly... I think there are um, lots of possibilities out there that we haven't even considered. Some that are already being modeled in some places. So if we do, if we really research what's out there that's working really well, and then you know that becomes a platform, and from there we can we can cr keep creating new things uh, and make it very easy and accessible for people. Yeah. Somehow we have to create. And that's a bit what I'm trying to do at the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy is start bringing that material together into a central location so that it's organized and you don't yes. have to hunt and pack. And then, you know, kind of keep organizing, keep refining it to make it kind of more accessible. Yeah. yeah. L let me let me share another thing that, that you might find really interesting, Edwin. Mm -hmm. Are you are you familiar with a book called The Cultural Creatives by Paul Ray? Um, I've. I've heard cultural creatives, but I haven't heard that specific book. No. So, and, and, and there's an application of that book that was done by a man named um, David Johnston. Now, David Johnston was able to get green building to become code, to become the law of the land in Alameda County, which you live in, right? Um, um, yeah, it's Contra Costa, but it's nearby. Okay. Okay. So, in San Francisco, San Francisco County, and Alameda County, which includes Oakland and Berkeley and uh, several other small cities... He, he was able to get, for example, this is just as an example, green building to become code. Now, the, the book Cultural Creatives by Paul Ray says that before World War II, there were two main subcultures in the United States, and he calls them traditionals and moderns. And traditionals have a, a value structure that really emphasizes security and safety and um, private rights, and the moderns really have a value structure that emphasizes um, personal achievement, economic growth, scientific rationality. So almost like typical old school Republican conservative values and more modern values. But then Paul Ray, he says that after World War II, there was a third major subculture that showed up on the scene and he calls them cultural creatives. And these are the folks that brought us the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement in the late 60s. And um, when you speak the language of one of those three subcultures, you end up turning off the other two. And what David Johnston did, using this concept and using some of the concepts in uh, from Ken Wilber's integral work, uh, and this is how he got green building to become the law of the land in, in, in those areas I mentioned in California and also some places in Colorado, 
is he created three distinct marketing strategies. So for traditionals, he would emphasize safety. And so, for example, did you know that most conventional insulation, fiberglass insulation, is soaked in formaldehyde and you don't want your children around that, right? And then for the moderns, he would emphasize cost saving. So with green building, you're going to really save a lot of money on your maintenance charges. You know, by the way, it's good for the planet. He wouldn't emphasize the impact on old growth forests and all the environmental benefits of green building unless he knew the crowd already had those values because the environmental movement, and this is where this is relevant, I think, to building a culture of empathy, the environmental movement has not gotten traction for 40 years because we've always thought that what we needed to give people was more information, more data. So we give people more information on, on climate change or we give more information on species extinction or deforestation or soil erosion or whatever it is, and we think that's going to motivate people to act, but it's not. What we actually need to do is craft our message so that we reach people where they're at. And I think in building a culture of empathy, part of the, the, the road ahead is how do we make empathy sexy? And how do, we, how, do we, how do we make empathy something that a conservative Republican, how can we talk about empathy as if Ronald Reagan was talking about it? You know, and how can we talk about empathy in a way that somebody who's really interested in making a lot of money on Wall Street, how can we help them get, get it? You know, really get empathy because most of the people that are already have an affinity toward the concept are more of the cultural creatives, greens, uh, progressives. So anyway, I think that that's yeah, going to be part it's of basically the. Basically, you're saying to uh, mm -hmm. empathize with all everyone in society is to speak to what their values are. If you speak yes. to the Republicans, listen to their values. If you speak to progressives, yeah. hear what. So you don't go to kind of tell them what to do. You go yes. to empathize with them. It's like the means are the end. And, yes, and we empathize with them, and then we craft our message so that it reaches them in a place of what is important to them already. Well, I can tell you uh, just a short uh, story here. Uh, I, did, I have gone to the Tea Party rallies and kind uh -huh. of talked to people there about empathy and I've been yeah. to the Republican State Convention and, and talked to yeah. Republicans. And I kind of come more for the progressive side, but I'm even yeah. leaving that and saying I'm coming from the empathy side. So when I went okay. to talk to Republicans, they were saying that uh, I said, well, tell me about your values. What's important to you? And the Republican, uh, there was a couple of young Republicans there and they, they said, um, you know, protection. I'm, you know, if somebody hurts me and my family, I'm going to protect myself. So I said, protection is important to you. So that's right. You know, we're going to defend ourselves. And, you know, if somebody comes into my house, you know, we're going to, you know, he didn't say shoot them, but you know, it was kind of implied. Basically, it was implied. It was implied. And then I said, so yeah. security is important to you. And he says, that's right. And then we kept talking and I just kept empathizing, hearing what his values were. And yeah. then I said, what you're concerned about is that though people will come into your house and do you harm. And he said, that's right. And so people who do you harm are people who would not be empathizing with you. So you're kind of like yeah. concerned about people not empathizing with you. I said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, and so I said, so we're really on the same page here is it's like, how can we create more empathy in the world yeah. together? How can we work together to create yeah. more empathy so that you feel safe and protected? And empathy yeah. creates safety. And, and, and it creates safety. And it actually went a step yeah. farther, which kind of sometimes almost brings tears to my eyes, just remembering this. But mm. one of, it was like three young Republicans, one of them brought up like an iPhone. And he said, you know, a friend of mine, he was a total jerk, total self-selfish, self-centered. And his mother was dying of cancer. And one of the last things she did was wrote him this letter. And he said, I would like to read it to you. I happen to have it on my you know, iPhone. And he went through and read it. And it was like, son, it's so important that you care, care about people. You know, it's like the most important thing in life. And, and then he read through the whole thing. It was along those lines. And uh, he said, this changed my friend's life. He's totally a different person now. You know, his mother died, but this was the last words that she said. And, you know, but that he would share something like that that was so personal 
and yeah. it totally shifted the conversation. I just felt such a connection with them. Yeah, yeah, nice. I love that. I love that. So, how can we get uh, our leaders to really realize that it's in our national interest that it's that it's a national security issue? Empathy is. You know, it, 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 uh, that's the you know, connection could, right there to national security. It, it's, it's like it's yeah. totally scalable from the individual yes. to the top person. That's that's. Uh, yeah. 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 And seeing seeing Earth as a neighborhood, you know, we have these these neighbors over there. How can we create a high quality of connection so that there doesn't need to be animosity? There doesn't need to be adversarial nature. Are, are you familiar with this? Uh, there's a Japanese story of heaven and hell. No, I haven't um, heard that. I read it in, a, in an Aikido book a, a long time ago, and I love Aikido. It's a martial art mm -hmm. that is not about kicking somebody's butt, but how to neutralize an attack in a way that preserves the integrity of both parties. And so I think you'll like the story. There's a, there's a prince, very um, virtuous prince, and he dies, and his guardian angel shows up and says, well, I'm going to take you to heaven. Do you have any last wishes before I take you to heaven? And, and the prince says, well, I'd like to see hell. Before you take me to heaven, I'd like to see what I'm missing out on and what, what hell is like. So, <clears throat> so he takes him to, to hell. And in hell, what he sees is a long banquet table with the most sumptuous, amazing meal. And have you heard of this story before? No, I have. It's great. <laughs> and there, and there, there are people sitting around the table, and everybody has three-foot-long chopsticks from their pinky and forefinger. And the, the chopsticks are so long that they can't feed themselves. And so, but, and everybody looks irritated and, and, and gaunt and, and they look hungry, even though they have this amazing food. And because they can't feed themselves, they spend their entire time knocking food out of each other's chopsticks. Mm. So that's hell. So then he takes him to heaven. And what he sees in heaven is this long, sumptuous banquet table with uh, amazing food and everybody sitting around it has three foot long chopsticks from their pinky and, and forefinger and everyone looks well fed and everybody's enjoying wonderful conversation and everybody looks happy and because they can't feed themselves they spend their entire time extending food to one another oh wow yeah it's like the essence of empathy it's like we're kind of with empathy we're kind of feeding each other kind of meeting yeah. those needs of uh, sustenance yeah. 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 So that's the, that's the difference between heaven and hell right there. Yeah, I think it's the difference between a culture of empathy and a culture of uh I don't know what something of <laughs> lack of fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, yeah. you know, I uh we we talked about these are great stories. I really feel I could talk with our, for hours with you uh on this, but um we only want to talk about uh, uh, for an hour and we've gone Probably have about ten minutes left. Uh, so um, we had we had started talking about uh, empathy and the definition of empathy. And one way I like to look at the definition uh, is like a, a metaphor. Like typically, empathy is defined as standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. And uh, I was wondering if you have like a personal metaphor. Like if you you know for you, what is empathy like in, in those kind of terms? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I, I, I really no the, the reason, the reason that I don't tend to emphasize all the levels of empathy that you mentioned is because as an NVC trainer, I'm, I'm trying to help people um, do something very specific, which is how to create a high quality of connection with another person or maybe a couple other people. And so it is at that sort of more personal scale. And <clears throat> The way that I think about empathy on a, on a, in a one-to-one -one situation is, is this idea of being totally, totally, totally present. And, and one image that has been helpful, I think, for me and, and, and perhaps for others, and I learned this from another trainer named Susan Skye, is she talked about when you're totally present with somebody else that you have this experience almost like you have these energetic arms that are extending and sort of embracing the other person. And so uh, that's an image that comes to mind, but I don't have a specific metaphor in terms like of it, how uh, I would. Empathy is like energetic arms that embrace the other person. Sure. That's like a, that's a metaphor. Yeah, yeah, so something like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's tricky because in NVC we, we do make a, some, some important distinctions between say empathy and sympathy and sometimes saying we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes that could be sympathy rather than empathy and so so I, I, I sometimes stay away from metaphors if they um, can in any way create more confusion rather than clarity. Yeah, um, I kind of like metaphors because metaphors uh, sometimes carry an emotional charge to them. Yes, you know, so yes. you can kind of you can convey an emotional felt sense. Yes, for example, yes. for me, empathy. I love metaphors, oh, by the way. Yeah. I do love uh, metaphors. But you don't want confusion. You're trying to keep yeah. from having confusion, have a sense of clarity is important. Yeah, sorry, I cut you oh, off. Oh, no, so that's fine. Um, for me, empathy is like a cornucopia. So uh, mm. as we're sharing, you know, I'm seeing you on the screen here, and we're sharing these insights, these feelings. It's like that sense of connection create is like the the fruits and the vegetables and all that wonderful things kind of coming out so it's that yeah so that's kind of my personal metaphor for it i like it yeah i have fun with that so like the horn of plenty <laughs> empathy is like the horn of plenty there you go <laughs> um. So are there any uh, kind of areas you feel like we should still cover uh, in our conversation here? Um, we can always, you know, continue this at another well, time too. kind of go more into specifics. But sure, sure. No, you know, I really I really want to encourage anybody watching this or any of your viewers to really take responsibility for their own growth and evolution and for their own um, continued learning about empathy and about um, how to make the world a better place and uh, to avail themselves of all the resources that they can to help them in, in, in that journey. Whether, you know, and I'm not talking about just financial resources, but it could be classes or workshops or other um, people resources that, that they can um, use because we're, you know, we're, we're really all in it together and we need to be in, in this culture of extending to one another uh, rather than... Um, in the, the this contracted space where we're, we're keeping the food out of each other's chopsticks, uh, so so yeah, that's that's the that's the only thing that I would that I would have to say, just sort of as as parting words. And uh, thank you very much for for having me in the interview. Well, thanks so much uh, for being part of this. I you know when I saw your uh, video, I thought, oh, I got to really talk to you because uh, just the way you conveyed the inf the the. The, your what you were conveying, you know, just felt very personal, and I, you know, I think you mm. must be a really wonderful, you know, teacher. Um, I mean, your workshops and all that, because yeah. I think that really comes across. So, yeah, and, I'm glad you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm glad I'm glad you like that video. I've got some some new ones that I'm working on, and I'm really excited to share them. And they're not quite done, but um, and they're all along these lines. So I think that you, you're really going to like them see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.